Okay, praise the Lord, right? Happy Sabbath, right? The Lord is good. You brought your sword, right? Regardless of the microphone and so on and so forth. Uh, the devil's going to have his little tools, and uh, he's going to be trying, isn't he? But you know what? He shall not succeed. Isn't that right? By the grace of God. We're glad to have you here. And again, you brought your sword with you. We're going to be studying our subject once again. We're going to be studying about I want that what? Power. We've done it for several weeks. I believe this is probably in the fourth. I think the fourth part. And it's okay to have parts because God's Word, right, is, you know, it's just it's so exceeding. It's just so much there that we can study God's Word and study God's Word and there's more, more, more. So we want to be able to do that, that God will help us to be able to see. We looked at, we looked at four areas, by the way, and those at home, we want to always encourage you to get your Bible and sit down and, be, you know, fellowship with us here. And uh, I know if we do that and we study, we're going to be prepared for the soon coming of Jesus. We talked about four areas that we wanted. When you say, I want that power, first of all, if you really want the power of the Holy Spirit, you have to desire. Isn't that right? In other words, you have to want it. Anything in life, if you want to do it, first of all, I want that, I want that Elmer's glue. Isn't that right? You wanted it. In our Christian experience, you have to want that experience first. You want that power. And so in the Christian experience, we want that power. And then number two, we want to prepare to what? To receive that power. You know, to have power come upon us and we're not prepared to receive it and deal with it, handle it, it would be of no avail. And number three, we want to, how to receive that power and receiving it, what takes place in our life. And number four, as that power comes in, we receive it in, we'll be witnessing like we've never witnessed before. And I want that, don't you? I want to be able to witness for Jesus Christ because I know that He's coming soon. And I do know that probation is soon to close. I just sense it from things that are happening in the world. Do you see it? We live in a time that we've never really seen before. There are things that are happening in the world that the leading economist, the leading right people in high positions are saying to us, we, we, you know, they won't come out and admit it, but they're really letting us know they don't know how to deal with it. They really don't have the answers. They're hoping for some miracle to take place and in the time being, they're just putting a little Band-Aid on it and hoping for the best. We need to know Jesus now more than we ever did have acquainted with Him before. The Bible said we went a couple of weeks ago, not by might nor by power, in Zechariah chapter 4. Do you remember that? Not by might nor power, but by what? By my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So today we're moving forward in the might and power of Jesus Christ. Remember, as we open the pages of God's precious word today, they are for you, they are for me. They're for anyone who will by faith accept them. So every promise that is in the book, I can claim it. How about you? Can you claim it? Yes. And God wants to give it to you. He wants you to receive it. He wants you to deal with the issues. He wants you to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, through Him. And so I want us to contemplate on that this morning. Have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn, as we did several weeks ago, to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, as we continue in our study. Pro uh, 2, yeah, verses 1 through 5. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now, we've read them several times, so we won't go through this week. We'll save ourselves a little bit of time in so doing. But if you underline that we've underlined several words that we thought were very, very interesting that we wanted to study because, again, we want to receive that power. And so we underline such words as, I want to receive the power. Isn't that right? Receive the words. I'm going to take the words and I'm going to hide them. As you read 1 through 5 of Proverbs 2, you'll see it. And then in order to receive those and to hide them, we're going to have to incline our, the Bible says, our ear. See, a lot of people on this Sabbath day are not inclining their ear. They're not within hearing distance. They're within sleeping distance. You know, they decided that they were tired because, probably some because of the holidays got them down. Just wore them out. They just partied too long. It was just too much. And now when it come time to fellowshipping with Jesus, what? They didn't have time. They were too tired. Now let me tell you something today. That's not your problem, evidently. You're here. But those who are not here, it's no secret. I, I, I tell them to face to face. Isn't that right? That's unacceptable in the sight of God. Unacceptable to say that I've stayed out too late, uh, I've partied too hard, even if it's not bad partying, if you're with me. 
but I just wore myself down and I just can't come into your presence this morning. What makes us think that we're going to go to heaven? Is God really a priority? Have we been thinking about the Sabbath? Have we been planning for the Sabbath? As soon as the Sabbath ends tonight, we need to be planning, isn't that right? For the next Sabbath day. God wants us to be planning for spending time in His presence. Some of us maybe have lost sight that we need to spend that time in His presence. Think about it. But some of us think, well, we, we know the message, we've heard it all of our life, and so we don't need to hear it again. I know everything that's going to be said. There are not going to be any know-it-alls in heaven. Did you know that? Let's just be real frank, shall we? A lot of people, well, I know, I know. Well, God's saying, well, that's fine. If you know, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to so order your life in harmony with God's Word? Today, none of us need to think that what God has written here in Holy Scripture can be ignored or rejected and heaven still be our home. Biggest fight you'll have, biggest fight I'll have is who? What? Self. Our self because we want I'm inclined to do this. Well, I've done this all my life. This is the way I feel. I want to do this. I will keep you, I, right? Self will keep you and me out of heaven. We have to submit to the authority of the King of Kings. And what He says in His Word, He means it. And don't think that we're going to ever slip by. That we're going to do something that's undetected by heaven. Heaven's well aware. After all, I'm looking for a one-way ticket there, by the way, someday. How about you? And God's not going to allow anything into heaven that's going to disrupt heaven. Are you still with me? He's not going to allow anything through those gates, dear friends, that will corrupt heaven the way this world is corrupted. Because my Bible said sin will not rise up again the second time. That means impatience. That means temper. That means bad habits are not going to inherit the kingdom of God, and we've got to give victory right here, right now. This is what is it about. And so we read something in the Word, and we'll say, Oh, man, that crosses the grain of my nature. Let it. Let it. This is what it's all about if heaven's going to be our home. Remember, God never asked you to give up anything that is good for you. Does that make sense? Never will he say, give up something if it's good for you. He wants you to have the good things because that's what it says in the Word. The only thing that he wants from us is to be willing to give those things up to him. When we read Scripture, I've read, you know, reading Scripture, a lot of things cut me pretty hard sometimes. They say, stomp on your toes a little bit. And sometimes during the heartache and the pain, sometimes as we read these things, I still say, thank you, Lord. You love me because you're pointing it out. Now I'm going to have to turn to you for help because I can't quite get this victory on my own. And God wants us to see ourselves, and wants us to do, and I'm inviting you to do it as I do, do it today, is to do a little self-examination. It's not for me to examine you. King of kings are going to do that. I'm not to judge you. I'm not to wonder, oh, does he, does she, does, that's not the issue. But I tell you one thing that we are to deal with, the pastor needs to be dealing with, and the church members have to deal with. And dear friends, that would be open sin. Are somebody still with me? When it's open and out there, you have to deal with it. What we're fighting inside and to ourselves, and we're in the North 40. You and God take care of the issue. But when it becomes open and it affects the church, it affects us. It needs to be dealt with as such. And that's always difficult to do because feelings are on the line. Have you ever noticed that? People's hearts, people's mind, and I and me. But yet God requires it of faithful church members, of a faithful pastor. I can't be counted faithful if things, you know, go against Scripture and we continue to go that direction. But we are to labor with, as we've been reading this work, we labor together to win our brothers and our sisters, right, into the truth. To be firm in the truth. To love and to win, not to drive away. But the truth will be the issue, right, of Scripture that will either say we're going to go that way or we'll go the opposite, right? It'll be God says against what I want. Now, do, is there anything in your life that's worth giving up heaven? 
we're going to say, oh, no, no, no. But yet maybe we're making choices that way. We could be making them at the same time saying, no, it's not really worth it, but I know if I keep doing it, I'm not going to be there. The Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so I think Paul made it in Scripture. I was reading this morning. Paul said in Scripture that, you know, he said, oh, we need to be you know, on the milk. You heard about the milk of the word? There are times that we need to be on the milk of the word. But Paul desired to give them meat of the word. Are you still there? He wanted to give them meat because milk, dear friends, is just that which is just necessary to keep alive. We need more than that. Yes, there's times when people come in and, yes, you've, you've got to feed accordingly. But he didn't want them to stay on the milk. He wanted to feed them something that's deep. Milk, you don't have to search. Did you know that? It's just there. The meat, you've got to search in Scripture to see whether these things be so or not. And so there's a time we have to get off of the milk and get into the meat of the Word. And let me tell you, the meat of the Word was sometime, my mom used to say, going to skin you. Have you ever been skinned? I feel like I have sometimes. You know what? The Word has done it. But it's things that need to go. It's things that need to part. I'm looking today to find out about how I can have that divine nature that God wants to give me. Because this flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God like it without a change. Are you still with me? And I read an article, and if you'll just bear with me. And those at home, bear with me. See, a lot of them think when they're home and they watch these, they can get up and go to the bedrooms and go play around and get on the phone. You know, get off the phone, quit texting. I'm going to get on to them a little bit. Is that all right, church? I know what they're doing. But we need to stay focused because the Bible says that we need every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, I'm not talking about myself here. I'm talking about if the word be true, and I'm reading from Scripture, from Spirit of Prophecy, it's every word. Isn't that right? We need every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We can't afford to miss anything. See, the devil, if he knows what's going to... You think the devil knows what's going to be spoken on Sabbath? Do you think he does? Somebody tell me. Yes, yes he does. Why? Do you know the Sabbath school lesson, by the way? Why? Because he's standing over your shoulder and he knows exactly what's going to be taught and he knows exactly what will affect each individual member. He knows you better than you know yourself. The Spirit of Prophecy says he does everything in his power to make sure that they're not there on that given subject or word spoken because he knows it will change their heart and their life. Now, can any of us bear to be in that position? Because it may be that word, and if you trace back in your life, there was a time that there was a word in due season. That word may have been repeated over and over, but it didn't really do you any good for maybe years of your Christian experience. And then one day, one day, someone said, Sabbath school class teaching, maybe just in a Bible study, somehow somebody said something and a light went on. Did you ever have that? Yeah. And all of a sudden it meant something. Yes. Yes. This is what it's all about. I'm a believer of the identifying marks of the remnant church. There are two. What are those two again? They keep what? <coughs> Excuse me. The commandments of God and have what? Testimony, right? Of Jesus Christ, which is what? Spirit of prophecy. That should not frighten anyone. It should be a real blessing. Because there's a gift in 1 Corinthians called the gift of what? Prophecy. And it will be on operation until how long? Until Jesus comes. And so then that's why Paul says we need to try the spirits to see whether they be so. If it harmonizes with Scripture, praise God, thank Him for it. So I'm striving by the grace of God today to be a partaker of divine nature. Let's talk about that just for a moment, or I'll read this from the Review and Herald article. This was written in 1888. That's a long time ago, isn't it? Now, after a while, is it true or false? After a while, uh, you know, truth is no longer truth because time goes by. Is that true? You know, if it's truth in 1888, surely today it's not true. If truth is truth, it doesn't, right? Time has no bearing on it. Is that true? Doesn't matter. One, if it's truth, it's always truth and it never changes. The world says truth changes. They say it changes, it cycles. No. Truth is always truth. It never changes. 
said, let everyone who desires to be a partaker of divine nature, and that's all of us here, appreciate the fact that he must escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Everyone that wants divine what? Nature. They're going to have to escape the corruption that is in the world through, what's the word? Lust. There must be a constant, earnest struggling of the soul against the evil imaginings of the mind. Are you there? There must be a steadfast resistance of temptation to sin in thought or act. Wow. The soul must be kept from every strain, notice this, through faith in Him who is able to keep you from falling. That's very scriptural, is it not? Now, what about the mind? Should it be on the world or should it be on things of God? It should be on things of God. There's no doubt about it. We talked about several instances about wisdom. Do we need the wisdom of God? Absolutely, we need God's wisdom. Wisdom of the world is foolishness, isn't that right? It's not going to get you off of this planet. No matter how smart you are, I hear people sometimes, well, they brag about their IQ being so high. So what? They didn't have anything to do with it. It's a gift, and that makes that person more accountable. It's good that they have it. Praise God for people, right, for the things that God has given them the ability in the world. Think about it. Probably if it had been up to me, we'd still be looking for the wheel, how about you? But look of all the things that God has given man the ability to do from, you know, hospital, surgeries, all this. God's given all this information because He loves us. Oh, friend, how we should thank Him every day. But said we need to guard the mind. I'm going to have to struggle, the Bible says here. Because of the lust of what? The mind. It says the imagining of the minds because sin begins where first? in the mind before it's ever played out. So we have to struggle against that first of all when it enters where? The mind, when the wrong thought comes in, we have to say, God, I need some help. Amen. Well, I want to go do something. And then the Holy Spirit will say, this is not right. God, I need some help. The enemy. The imaginings, evil imaginings of the mind is brought out here. There has to be a steadfast resistance. Think how weak we are getting, it seems like. How much resistance do we really have? Think about it. How much can you have? Can you have enough resistance by the grace of God to gain victory in your life? Huh? No. What, by the help of God, we can. All things are possible. Isn't that right? He is able, the Bible says, to keep me from what? From falling. And so when we fall, it's because we choose to fall. Nobody made you do it. You chose to do it. Isn't that right? I hear people say, well, I want to quit this. I want to quit this. I want to start this. Oh, but I tell you, friend, don't blame the pastor. Don't blame the church. Don't blame the elders of the church. Don't blame anybody else. Take the blame yourself. That's where it's going to lie, is in results. God said what? You're more than conquerors through Him. That's exactly why. I want that power so that I can gain the victory over these things. See, an impatient person, and it doesn't sound bad, but I believe an impatient person is going to have to conquer that. How about you? Because my Bible said here is the patience of the saints. Here's the patience. I've heard people in the church for 30 and 40 years say, yeah, but you know, God understands. Yes, He does, but it's too bad. Let's get real about this issue. Yes, God understands. Yes, we you're hereditary, cultivated. Yeah, we've been cultivating this bad habit for 40 years. God understands that too, but God is able. Isn't that right? God is able. The enemy is trying to becloud our minds. He's trying to fill them with thoughts and things of this world that take the place of godly things and thoughts. Should I be praying, God help me with my, with my mind? God, control my thoughts, control my actions. But yet, we, we, somebody might be saying, at home they may be saying, you know, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm struggling. Yes. Heaven is, gain heaven's, it's, it's a war going on. We talked about it, a couple of brothers and I talked about it here just before we came up here. So they've never sensed anything like it 
in their Christian experience. Everything that they go to do, it's like the devil, the enemy, is leaning on them. He's putting his weight on them. It's not just the temptation and kind of leave you alone. It's the constant pushing, putting weight against you, wearing you down to where you say, you know, I just I can't fight no more. I just, I'm going to give up. At that point in time when we are the weakest, Paul said, we can become what? The strongest. See, this is where it's at. We have to praise God even when the enemy is laying on us, when he's pushing down on us. When about ready to give up, we have to cry out, Father, help me. When Peter was going down in the water, he said, oh, oh I need some help. A second or two before that, he was feeling good. He was riding, walking on the water, wasn't he? But it wasn't until he's gone down until he said, Oh, Jesus, I need some help. When there's people today who's just kind of splashing around a little bit, they come up and get a little air and they think it's good. Jesus wants you to walk on the water. He doesn't want you to just tread it. See, some of us are happy treading. I think our Christian experience should be stronger than that, don't you? We'll feel the weight. We'll feel the pushing of the enemy. We'll sense the struggles. We'll shed tears about it. We'll spend time on our knees, but it's to make us stronger. Don't you believe that? That's what all this is about. That's why you were tried today, you know, this last week, maybe many of you. In a lot of areas where you just say, well, you know if I quit now, what am I going to do? I've heard people say that. I just, I almost, I'm, he's driving me to the point I almost want to quit. Say you're going to quit. Who are you going to quit? You're going to quit Jesus? You're going to quit being a Christian? I'm going to quit the church? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? If you're smart, you won't. Don't get weary in well-doing. He is our only hope. If I want that divine nature, if I want my mind to change, if I'm going to war against the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh, the mind, how can we do that? Because after all, we already agreed that it begins where? In the mind. Before it's acted out. Everybody knows that here. The children know it here. They may know it in a different sense than you do, but they know they thought about that cookie jar that mom said don't get into. And they want to make sure mom wasn't around when they went and got in that cookie jar. Is that right? And they want to make sure there was no noise when they got in that cookie jar. And when they finally got into that cookie jar, if you're like I am sometimes, I get in the cookie jar, I say, why take one cookie? Let's take a couple. <laughs> when I was at home, if I decided to get in their cookie jar, I decided I'm going to get beat. I'm going to get a whipping over this. I might as well get a couple. Well, that wasn't good. But I'm saying it's what the enemy can kind of lure you into his trap. Remember, dear friend, we're not to tread. We're to walk on water by the grace of God. He's calling a people to be like him. We talked about heavenly wisdom. We talked about inclining our ear to him. About applying our hearts to understanding of Scripture. We've got all kinds of passages we could look up on all these things today, but I believe that you get what I'm talking about. Understanding, wisdom, seeking, as it were, for truth, for, as for hidden treasure. God will continue to use the simple things to confound the mind of the wise. Did you get it? The simple things. How often have you heard that we have to seek for truth like hidden treasure? How many have heard that all their life, basically? You seek, right? For, you, you just, and, and we say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yet, how many of us are really, don't raise your hand, how many of us are really seeking God's Word as we would for hidden treasure? What you hold in your hand today, right here, is worth more than it, uh, the, the, anything that you, more than gold and silver. This is eternal life. This is a fountain of youth. This is happiness and joy and peace forevermore. Amen. There may be some in here today, including myself, we, we may not live to see the coming of the Lord. And then we could very well. But we're here for a few short days and then we're gone and then what? And Yeah. Treasure? We're to search for it as what? For hidden treasure. Are we really doing that? Are you doing that today? Are you really searching it? Do you really want heaven to be your home? Are you seeking for this hidden treasure? Are you, are you saying, Lord, every word that proceeds out of your mouth, I want it. And then, Lord, help me to order my life. Dear friends, some of us understand things that we're not doing, and God says, no, it's not going to work. 
What we understand is what we become what? Accountable for. Is that right? So if we understand it, let's get this clear today if we don't get anything else. If we understand it to be truth, and then we refuse by the grace of God to order our life, we are not in harmony with heaven. And if you're not tuned up and in harmony with heaven, we're not going there. See, the world teaches things different. And maybe some of you have been in the world more than you've been in the church. I don't know. And a lot of these things are hard for us to get out of our mind. And even today, most churches are always teaching, just do the best you can, and that's going to be good enough. Not going to work. The Bible is clear. Jesus said, I'm coming, the Ephesians, after a church without what? Spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And what do, you, what do we think sin? What is sin all about? How does the Bible define sin? Yeah, sin is separation, but sin is a transgression, 1 John, right? What is it? Sin is a transgression of God's law. And because sin is offensive to God. His son was willing to come down here and die because that law could not be changed. It's all about sin. Sin separates us from God. And you and I are going to have to make those choices every day of our life. By God's grace to do good or we're going to be doing evil, right? There's no middle ground, is there? Jesus said, he who is not with me is what? Is against. No one here today wants to say, I'm against God. You know, there's people in the world that will say that. And God is so loving and merciful and kind, He tolerates it for a season. He'll, he'll let people blaspheme Him. He'll let people call Him names. But the time will come that He will show Himself to be God, who He is. He'll change, you see, the minds and the hearts of the people who are willing but those who are not willing, dear friends, that one day they will all say, what, well, recognize Him as God. Isn't that right? One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. What if you knew you had five years left to live? You don't know the Lord won't come in less than five, do you? He could come before five, could He not? Easily. How would you so order your life? I hear people saying today, boy, I tell you, just like if I could just get more out of life. The Bible is so clear that if we should gain the whole world and lose our own soul. Think about it. Gain the whole world but lose our own soul. So you have. It's only for a season, isn't that right? And then what? We lose heaven. When, when will we so order our life? How can I have this mind of Christ? How can I have divine nature? Let me just give you just a few things to think on today. They're very, very simple. But for those that, at home and viewing and maybe listening on the road, wherever they might be, contemplate these simple things from Scripture. The principle is there. We've been fighting things, let's say, in our life. We've not gained the victory. We're not climbing the way we want to climb that ladder. Have you ever felt like that in your life? That we're climbing a ladder by faith right toward heaven. And it seems like we're just stuck on the rung. You ever feel like you've been stuck? You know, the little legs are kind of kicking just a little bit. Isn't that right? But you can't lift them high enough to get to the other rung to push yourself on up. Now, this is a reality, dear friends. These are reality. We must be putting forth every effort by the grace of God, dear friends, to climb higher and higher. I shared this many times before in years of experience and conversion experience. For me, and my relationship with God, and my heart, and my desire, and God gave me a dream about it. And He showed me this staircase toward heaven. It wasn't a ladder, it was stairs. And He said, look up. And I looked up, and I seen this man really giving it the dickens, we call it. He, was di he wasn't walking. He was laid out prone on those steps that were going about this angle toward heaven. He wasn't up very high. He didn't make it very long. He couldn't just stand and just walk up and say, oh, this is easy. Oh, yeah, Woo, I'm going on up to glory. It seemed like everything that he did was a fight. Couldn't do anything if the enemy wasn't fighting. And it's like the Lord said, look closer. Looked at that light. Looked at those steps. And I looked, and I seen the man reach this way, and his head turned this way, and I looked, and it was me. 
Oh, what, what? And by faith, laying out on those steps, not walking, but laying out, he would reach and just get a little fingernail in that next step. And by the time he would get a hold of it, there came the enemy. Because his feet were on a step on the very edges, and they pushed with his little feet and dig with this hand, and the enemy had a, listen to me careful, he had a chisel. And where his feet was on, he chiseled it off right quick, and the feet slipped, but the hand held. Amen. And I seen him immediately go up and say, ooh, he's only holding by one hand, I can get him now. And he began to chisel that one hand. And I seen him chisel, oh God, help me. I want to make it to heaven. And God would, by strength, reach one more hand, uh, and just get a hole right here, and all oh, that and broke loose. The devil said, quickly, let's call the aid. Let's get some more. You chisel here, and I'll chisel over here. And about the time this one here let go, the feet found a firm foundation. Oh, wow. I thought, boy, heaven, it's going to be tough to gain. At every step, at every hold, you get upon the rock of Jesus Christ. The devil's there to steal it away. Chisel it away. But you know what? He never won that struggle. Amen. By faith, God always had some footing. But it was an effort. It was a struggle. I'm thinking, oh Lord, how everyone is just like, it strains every fiber in your body to try to gain one more victory, to get a little bit closer to you. And he said, heaven's going to cost. Heaven's going to cost. I said, Lord, help me to realize it's going to be worth it. But if I give up now, what's going to happen? I'm going to slide back down. and It's going to be much more difficult, listen, to go back up that steps again because most of us chiseled away. It's not the easy climbing. It's going to be hard to get a hold of a grip. Are you still with me? And it's going to be a little bit higher. So wherever you're at in your experience, friend, don't quit. Don't give up. Because it will become more difficult to regain where God has you now. Heaven will not be easy. But when we get there, we'll say it's been cheap enough. It will be cheap enough, no matter what it costs us in this life. So today, dear, dear friends, in a few minutes, I want you to think. You're wanting that relationship with Christ the mind is warring against the flesh and the lust and all these things that are going on, the temptation. May I just encourage you, very simple put, a child can understand this. Number one, meditate upon Scripture. Think on Scripture, things that you have read, the promises that are there for you. Number two, think upon the plan of salvation, the eternal plan of salvation. It will help you when you're tested and you're tried to think that Jesus is willing to come down here, willing to live the life, to gain the victory for me. He was willing to die rather than to sin. He was nailed to the cross, but he said, Kenny can't make it unless I willingly give my hands. Jesus said, no man can take my life. No man can do it. No army can do it. No, right, no nation can do it. But I willingly lay down and I give my life for him. And you, isn't that awesome? I like it because he made it clear. In other words, I don't have to let you hold me down here. In fact, you don't even have to hold me. You realize when Jesus laid down there, as it were, on the cross, as they nailed him, he never struggled. Everybody else that they had come in contact with and they nailed to the cross or they hung, whatever they did, you realize what a fight was on their hands? They were kicking and fighting with everything within them, but Jesus willingly laid down, showing that he willingly gave his life for you and for me without fighting it. Friend, will you need to give your life to Jesus. I need to give my life to Jesus without fighting it. Without putting up such a fight, He is our friend. He's our power. He's our strength. But yet we fight Him so often about this and that little thing. And It doesn't matter if we look at the total picture about salvation. What you might lose in this life, you shall surely gain. What you have to give up, He'll give you more. 
And we're going to have to give some things up. Did you know that? We're all going to have to give up some more things. We're going to have to learn what it takes to please Jesus with all of our hearts. Have you ever wondered why some people have a very difficult time even coming to church? Helen White brings out they have difficult time, you know, with religious exercises. That means just going through the lesson studies and doing different things. It's, it's like distasteful. It's like, oh, it's painful. Friend, if it is today, don't get discouraged with it, but ask God to help you. Say, God, help me to love these things, and I know that I, I have to love these things, or heaven won't be my home. See, just don't want anybody fooling themselves today, right? You have to love what you do. You have to love Jesus. You have to love being in church. You have to love studying the Word. Instead of getting up and saying, oh, no, church again. But let me encourage you, even those at home, even if you feel this way, don't get discouraged. Take it to God in prayer. We said often here, He will give you the desires of your heart. Some of your desires, maybe your heart, have been met this week. And God wants to meet more of those, by the way. Contemplate upon Scripture. Contemplate on the eternal life and salvation. Think upon the infinite mercy of Jesus Christ. How much mercy He has for you. How many times He's forgiven you of the same issues like He has me. What mercy. And then He says, I want you to show that kind of mercy to your brothers and to your sisters. Don't be so condemning and judgmental. I've forgiven you time and time and time again. We're all sinners saved by grace. You know what the Bible says? When you're going through a struggle and a real test and the devil's really bringing his wrath against you and a temptation is coming, you're almost overwhelmed, dear friend. Think of that sacrifice that was made in your behalf. And he did it because well, he wanted to save you from that issue. Awesome. You want to know where you should go and what you should be doing or where you shouldn't go. Think upon the character of Jesus Christ. Would he go there with me? Would this make Jesus happy? How do we conduct our life every day that we have? We see those who are in need. We see those, you know, that maybe less and this and that. Are we helping? Are we doing all that we can do? Do we really have the mind of Christ? I thought about the other day when I passed up a, a hitchhiker. And then later on the same week, I passed up a motor vehicle on the side of the road. And I'm on my mind, I'm saying, you know, you can't hardly stop like you used to. I never passed anybody up. And now I'll tell you, people are so wicked, vicious. You never know what's going on. But I know God is greater. And just in my mind, you know, just in my, we do this at times, right? Just in our mind. I said, well, Lord, you know why I'm just in better pass them up because, you know, you just, just don't have time, blah, blah, blah. And I come back to my mind, because I said, I want to have the mind of Christ. And he said, if you had my mind, you, you, you would have stopped. Because I never passed up anyone in need. Man, I failed. So how in this world that we live in, do we so able to adjust and yet use good common sense? See, a lot of times the women shouldn't stop. And try to, you follow me, the men should be doing more of that because it's just, it's not safe. God knows that. He wants us to use good common sense. He's bigger, we understand, but he doesn't want us to be foolish. You know, we have locks on our doors. He wants us to lock those things. Are you with me? Well, God will take care of me. Don't be foolish. He takes care of those who do what they understand, right? Where they're at. Do the best you can. Then God said, I'll do the rest. So I'm just thinking even we call some of the little things of life and we find ourselves failing and falling short and saying, God, I want this. God will say, Jesus will say, this is what I would do if I were here. He wants us to do the same thing, doesn't he? That's his mind. Think about him, dear friends, if you're fighting a temptation about him as our mediator. Standing before the Father saying, my blood, my blood, when your name comes up in the judgment. How can we turn our back on Him? How can we get weak? How can we be vacillating? How can we turn our back and go back into the world and do things that are wrong? When you say, there He is, He's pleading my case. When you're really being tested and you're really being tried, think, dear friend, 
upon the mission of Jesus Christ to come and seek and save that which was lost. That was me. Think about it. We're going down the wrong path, but he said, I still came and I loved you while we were yet enemies. Isn't that right? Was seeking you. Didn't have anything to good to say about me. Your life wasn't in order. You hated me, but I'm still seeking you. It's a lesson for me to continue to seek and to witness and for those who despitefully use us. Contemplate heavenly themes today, friends. We have to have more than just the themes that are going on in the news. You know that? That's depressing. Anybody get depressed when you listen to the news? Oh, yeah. So in order to, to bypass what's going on in this world, I've got to think upon heavenly things. That the angels of heaven are always there. Angels of heaven see and record every action and thought and deed. If I do just a few of these things that we talked about quickly this morning, you know there's going to be some results. You know what the results will be? The results will be our love for Jesus will grow stronger. Now, did you get it, what we're talking about, right? Contemplate Scripture, the life of Christ, His character. If we contemplate all of these things in our hour of need, all of a sudden we begin to grow stronger in Jesus Christ. Our love for Him will grow more and more every day. And then we will find something else will happen. Our prayer life will become different. It will be like talking to a friend. It will, we will come to understand that we can talk to Him about everything. Every need, every desire, every victory, every failure, every shortcoming, we can still talk to Him. But our prayer life will become, listen carefully, more acceptable to Him as we contemplate Him. Because our prayer life will be mixed more with love and faith because we've been contemplating and beholding Jesus Christ. There becomes a time, and I believe it's now, that our prayer life needs to be more fervent. Some of us need to work up a fever, if you're with me. We need to get serious with God. We need to get down on our knees and we need to pray. If you're looking for a victory, get down and you pray till you've given that victory. That's when God knows you're serious about it. As we get down on our knees and say, God, I know that you can give me this victory. I know there's nothing impossible with you. And I want this victory more than anything in life because I, I'm afraid it's going to keep me out of the kingdom. God, I need your victory. God wants to give you that victory. He wants to give me that victory today. Our prayers have to be fervent. When Jesus prayed, dear friend, was his prayer fervent in the Garden of Gethsemane? Was it fervent? Sweat, as it were, what? He said, blood. We may not sweat blood, I don't know, dear friends, but we might need to sweat just a little bit. We can get down and get so in earnest that we break out into a sweat. Are you with me? Because our eternal life is at stake right here. We'll find our confidence in Jesus Christ will continue to grow as we behold Him. Our experience with Christ will grow daily. We'll see the power of Christ working in our life in answer to prayer We'll see that we want to witness more than we ever have. We want to tell Jesus about Jesus to everybody that we meet. We want to introduce them to Jesus. We want to be a soul winner. We want to love other people. And so by beholding, we do become changed. If we look to Jesus, who is our pattern, dear friend. And then we say, God, I have a desire to be transformed and changed. Remember, if you're desiring today, before we close, to be changed or transformed that means you can't keep going doing the things that you were doing if they're not pleasing isn't that right transformation means that you're changed and when God changes something or somebody he wants it to be permanent don't you think it's not this wafting back and forth all the time and we're hot one week and we're cold the next we're indifferent and we, we love to do this one week next week we don't aren't you glad Jesus wasn't that way he loved me with an everlasting love he set his sides, right? Well, he knew what his end results are going to be, Calvary. And yet he set his side on what? Living the perfect life so he could impart it to me and impart it to you. And when this change comes, I'm going to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. It's going to be more than, ooh, I want a good physical meal. You're going to say, no, I want my spiritual first. 
I want to be fed. I want to be watered. The more I think on Jesus Christ, the more I want to share Him. Do you know that? You realize if you've been studying during the week, you even get more opportunities and praying privileges to witness for Him than you had when you wasn't? Have you ever, ever, we ever weighed those things out? Yes. And then when the opportunity came, you just had words you didn't know you had. You had thoughts you didn't know you really had, but you'd been putting them in. You hadn't recalled what it, but all of a sudden they just come out. And you said, ooh, thank you, Lord. And your morning devotions, dear friends, with things that you read, you realize a morning devotion is God is setting you up for those things that will, will come your way during the day. There will be the answer to every question, every dilemma, every witness, the every th- word that needs to be spoken during that day if you soak it in that morning. Amen. You won't be saying, oh, I don't know what to do here. You're going to know. But when we fail to do that, dear friend, we fail, we fail our mission. We don't have the answer. We don't know what to do. Oh, draw close to Jesus today. Think on Him. Share Him. And then covenant with God that I, as a Christian, I have a sacred obligation. Sacred obligation to not only serve Him, but to serve my fellow man. Friend, pray. Pray with me today before we close. God, I'm, I'm receiving that word. I want to hide your commandments in my heart that I not sin against you. Lord, help me to every chance I get to incline my ear that I may hear your words. Lord, help me to be obedient to your words. Give me, Father in heaven, give me wisdom. Give me understanding of your word. Help me to seek and to search as for hidden treasure when I dig into your word. That I'm so excited about it that there's millions of dollars, as it were, as I would in the worldly millions of dollars, but I'm more excited because I'm digging in the eternal, endless you know, v- vessel that God has of truth. Oh, we need to see. And then as we close today, you know what? We need to fear God. And give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment, right, is come. Fear of God. Turn with me in the passage we close, our last one today, the book of Ecclesiastes. Book of Ecclesiastes, because this will be, as you know, and you put it to memory, I'm sure. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Verse 13, because part of our mission is serving God and fearing God, isn't it? Reverential fear, to realize who God is and who we are. So we're going to hear the whole conclusion of the matter, isn't that right? We're going to get down to the bottom line. Rubber's going to meet the road here. Verse 13 said, let let us hear the what? Conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and do what? Keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Let people say what they want to say, dear friends, that God's commandments are done away with. They are not telling you the truth. My Bible reads very plainly here that I fear God and that I keep His commandments, for this is my whole duty. Who would have the audacity to say, well, I see what it says there, and I can read it very plain, and there doesn't need to be a theological discussion upon it. There doesn't need to be a board to get together to decide what it says. It says this is my whole what? Duty. And then for the audacity of people to try to take God off the throne and to set on it and say, yeah, well, God's law is done away with. Think about it. Friend, do you realize the message that we have to give in this world until we start giving it to the point to where we challenge the mind and maybe even make people a little bit tight to where they get into the Word? They're going to take it like it just really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Just love Jesus, we're going to make it. We either have the last message of warning to give to the world or we do not. It's that simple. And it's going to wake people up to say what? How many people in here can say, well, it doesn't matter if we kill, steal, adultery, none of these matter. But when it comes to seventh-day Sabbath, what? People just like, oh, well, we don't have to worry about that. This is our whole duty is to give this warning message to the world. 
The majority of the world will reject it because they're not willing and don't want to do anything for Jesus. They say they do. They're not willing to give anything up. He is our creator, is he not? He's our redeemer, he's our sustainer. And all he asks is that you love him and fear him and honor him. That's all he says today. This is your whole duty, Kenny. And man comes along and says, well, you say it's a whole duty, but I can scratch out one or two if I want or whatever I want. Who, 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 we, who we think we are? You're dealing with God. And, it, you know, I, I think I just I have more respect and more fear, more love for him to think, why would he put up with that? Why would he put up with a little old lonely man who says, I know what you said, but it doesn't matter. He said, because I love you so much, I'm going to give you every opportunity. I'm going to give you every opportunity. Friend, he's given us opportunity today. Will you receive that? I want to receive it in my heart and in my life today. You know how victory is gained. You know who gives you that victory today. If you really want it in your heart and your life, it's got to be more than just every week I come and I make a decision for Jesus, but is it really changing? Is the word of truth changing your life? Are you so in love with Jesus that you're willing to so order your life in harmony with Scripture? This is where I have to come to. This is what you're going to have to come to this point. That I'm willing to so order my life by the grace of God. His power, His strength, I can't do it. But I'm going to submit myself so totally and completely because this is the whole duty. That He can take my mind, He can take my heart, He can take my life, and He can make me what He wants to make me. And friend, there's many times, I don't know about you, I feel almost like a broken vessel. A vessel has some cracks in it that's getting old. And a vessel sometimes doesn't even look like a vessel and doesn't sound like a vessel. But when, my, when I'm not, I'm not his representative. I'm not his child. He still loves me, yes. But he says, Kenny, when you feel that way, come to me and I'm going to remake you. As it were, I'm going to make you look like a vessel. And when you speak, you're going to speak like a vessel. Are you, still, are you still there? And what you speak, there'll be words of life and encouragement and cheer. But nothing is broken so badly. Those of home, you have to think about nothing broken so badly. Things that you've done, doesn't matter how often, doesn't matter right now. Simply we come to Jesus and we just commit ourselves to Him afresh. This is the good news of the gospel. Is that today can be the beginning. A fresh beginning. I want my life to be so ordered that I can be like Jesus. Friend, do you desire that today in your heart? I do, and I know it's not going to be without pain. And the pain it is is because I inflict it on myself because that's how fight hard I'll fight God. Are you with me? No one else. It can be painless or it can have some pain. And the pain is a result of me fighting God. Don't fight Him. Just give in. Let Him do the work. He said, I'm coming back to take you to, to glory one of these days. And I don't want to miss that. Do you? Is anyone too far broken? Anyone too far gone? No. He's able, is he not? Oh, friend, you want to raise your hand with me? Let's renew it once again, shall we? Our commitment to Jesus Christ. I want heaven to what? To be my home. And Lord, whatever it takes that I can spend eternity with you, let it happen. I trust you. And I love you. Let's pray about it. Shall we together? Let's kneel. Because of our microphones out, we'll stay here in, in front of the pulpit. Father in heaven, I thank you for your love today. I thank you for every precious hand that was raised. Lord, you know our hearts. You know many times our despair, despondency. Sometimes we're so weak and so vacillating, oh, it's an embarrassment to be called even a Christian. Lord, it doesn't need to stay that way. We come to church many times and we have the, the say, the good, good suit on or the good face. We go out in the world and it's not five minutes after we leave church that we're our old self again. That's not your will for us. You want us to be changed. You want us to have a little heaven right here and right now. You want us to have victory right now. Because as those victories come, then we in turn can help others gain those victories. In fact, many here can use their life experiences to help someone else overcome in the same areas. What an encouragement it is to say, you know, this, this may have been a situation of mine in the past, but God has given me victory. He touched my life. He's changed me. 
We don't have to be in the bonds, the handcuffs, as it were, of the enemy. We can be free in Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom that you want to impart to your children that we may be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Thank you for the decisions of every precious heart here today. And Lord, give them, as always my prayers, give them the desires of their heart. And I pray that desire is that I want to spend eternity with Jesus. We ask you to forgive us of our sins, our mistakes, our weakness. May those weakness become our stronger points. We know we'll have to be tested in those areas. And when we're tested and we prove faithful, we become stronger. Lord, I give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for being the God of heaven, the God of creation, the God of our lives. I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.